Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, I do have some announcements just briefly, most of which are in uh, your bulletin here, but just to call attention to them. Uh, one, this evening, 530, flocks. That's again outside our picnic time. Uh, bring your own food. Uh, we got some chairs. Bring your own chairs if you want something comfortable. Uh, and we'll just sit outside and cause trouble like we normally do. It'll be great. Uh, secondly, uh, not in the bulletin, but Tuesday is our Golden Oldies brunch. That's Tuesday, and uh, Lord willing, I'm hoping, since all of the restaurant restrictions were lifted on Friday, I'm hoping that we'll all be able to sit at the same table, but we'll see what Fort Mill Family Restaurant has in store for us on Tuesday. Uh, third, please note in here, uh, in the back, there's details for the Hope's uh, anniversary uh, gathering and, and celebration, how exciting that is, um, so we can join in with them. Uh, and then also, Lord willing, again, Lord willing, uh, two weeks until the new building. That's right now what it's looking like, two weeks, Lord willing. Again, that's who knows until we actually get in there, right? I mean, we still have government involvement, so you never know until it's done, but Lord willing, that's, that's what we're hoping for. Um, I think that's all the announcements I'm going to make right now. Take a few moments as the prelude is played. Prepare your hearts to meet with the living and true God. <clears throat> <clears throat> People of God, if the Lord is made able, please stand. <clears throat> his holy command, his kind command, his call to worship in Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea 
is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart and have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let us sing. Come, Christian, join to sing. Father in heaven, we do uh, gather together and praise you in response to your holy command, and we thank you for the privilege that we have to be gathered together with the people of God on this morning, your morning. We bless you, we praise you, and we thank you that as we come into your presence now for worship, we come into your presence in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't come in our own standing. We don't arrive before you in our own merit, for both of those things would be exercises in judgment. But instead we come to you in Christ, who has lived the perfect life, died an unjust death, was raised unto life, and has shared all of that with us. And so we come to you in his perfect record, and we praise you. We do also ask that you would showcase your mighty power through your spirit, by working in us now and changing our hearts to match that of the Lord Jesus in his worship of you. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Be seated, please. Statement of need, Isaiah chapter 1, starting in verse 9. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. 
when you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts. Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. <clears throat> Excuse me, the first two thirds of this passage uh, lay out an important principle, uh, and it is this that, that routine and rote obedience is not enough. Here, what's being addressed is the Jews are doing much of what would have been commanded for worship. And interestingly, the Lord is uh, disavowing that worship, saying, I, I don't want it. In fact, I even hate it. Because while you say that you're worshiping in this way, your hearts have not been made right. It's why, in fact, actually, I highlight that point many weeks in our uh, prayer of invocation at the very beginning of the service, uh, highlighting that when we come to the Lord God, we don't want to bring solely our own worship. Our hearts are the problem in the equation. Instead, we bring the Lord Jesus and his worship, for he is the only one that is righteous. And again, I, I, I love how this kind of undoes this American idea that I'm better than my neighbor. Because the Lord is saying, look, even at your best, your worship is the problem. Much less at your worst. Much less all the other things you do, but your worship itself is a problem apart from the Lord Jesus. It's why we confess our sins. Because apart from Christ, we have no hope. Let us pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
can be seated, please. <clears throat> Promise of pardon, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. And I would encourage you to pay attention. There's a, a laundry list of things that we're supposed to do here. But about three quarters of the way through, Paul is going to highlight a very significant reason why we are able to do these things, why these commands are here. God's word, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief steal no longer, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. This fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Laundry list of things to do. Some of these are very difficult, are they not? But intriguingly, right, right there in verse 30, isn't it? You have already been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God for redemption. His ministry cannot be broken, for we have salvation in Him. Let's stand and sing, Blessed Assurance. Be seated, please. <clears throat> Prayer of intercession from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. And, O oh Lord, we do praise you. And we praise you for the particular way in which you might have brought this psalm to life in our mind even this week. Verse 3, you tell us, Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. And Lord, we have been reminded, even this week, how easy it is for us to, to place our hope for the good life in humans. In this great country that we live in, so much of our news cycle currently is about figuring out which political party to place our hope in, which prince to place our trust in. And even this week, you have reminded us that you hold the president in your hand. It is foolish for us to trust in him, for as powerful as he might be by human standards, he is nothing in comparison to you. Not even a virus can take him out of commission for a season. Lord, we confess our sin. How easy it is for us to trust in a president or a government or a political party or our wealth or our retirement or our job or our intelligence or our beauty or our children or whatever else it might be instead of trusting in you. It is foolish to place our trust in creation in created things. For when our breath departs, these created things return to the earth. On that very day, our greatest of plans might perish. Forgive us. Instead, Lord, train us, teach us to place our hope in you. To place our hope in the uncreated. In the triune God. And it is for this reason that we come to you with our many requests. And we do begin with praying for our president, as we are commanded to do. We ask that you would restore him to health for the good of the nation, and that you would give him the wisdom on how to lead so that your people might lead quiet, peaceful, godly lives. That's what we're told to pray for, and so we do, O oh God. Restore him to health that he might lead in such a way that we might um, not have his or the government's interference in our piety and obedience. We also pray, O oh God, that you would use your church to proclaim the good news that your spirit would go forth using the word to set the prisoner free, to open the eyes of the blind, to lift up those that are bowed down, even to uphold the widow and the fatherless, until you end this creation and make it anew. We even pray that you would bless the ministry of Christ Ridge Presbyterian Church, Lord, that you would use uh, your people here to actively participate in the gathering and perfecting of the people of God. Bring in your people that we might hear the words of life. We pray that some would be brought from death into life. And we pray, O oh God, that you would grow us in obedience and the fruit of the Spirit for Christ's sake. Amen and amen. Uh, we do give thanks to God for the tithes and offerings he's blessed us with so richly. We acknowledge they are all from his hand. Let's stand and sing the doxology. <laughs> Take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> Matthew.
Matthew chapter 6. All right, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord written for you today. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's ask God's blessing. Father, we have read your word and heard your voice. We ask now that we would hear hear your word preached and again hear your voice. Give life and light, understanding and faith, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of working at the uh, mission work In Cherokee, North Carolina, most don't know this, I guess our denomination has uh, historically been very active uh, in Cherokee, North Carolina, uh, working to uh, plant a church and to do ministry amongst the Cherokee Native Americans there, uh, seeking to establish kind of a beacon for the gospel uh, in that area. It's been very hard labor, uh, very hard work, and it's been a struggle to get a church planted and growing. And through ministry there, I remember having conversations years ago talking with uh, some of uh, the, the young people there, some of the students in Cherokee, and beginning to learn that I, I suspect Harris has been one of the worst things that has ever happened to that people group, uh, kind of humanly speaking. The casino there has been absolutely devastating for them. They, uh, upon turning 18 or whatever it is, they get a, a large lump sum of money with 
money given to them every six months or every year uh, following that, and it trains them very early on that you know, they're going to be rich so that when they turn 18, they're going to get $60,000 and they'll never have to work ever again because $60,000 is everything you need to live on for the rest of your life. You get to be an adult and you realize that's a lot of money, but it doesn't go that far if that's the only income you have. But I remember stories talking with the students, and one of the things that, again, people don't realize is that uh, Harris pays for, at least my understanding at the time was, uh, Harris paid for college for any of those students anywhere in the world all the way through a Ph.D., Right, so if you are, grew up in the in Cherokee, you grew up as a Native American there, uh, part of the deal they have with the casino is the casino will pay for your education more or less forever. Uh, and in 15 years of ministry in that place, I never met a student that ever went to college. I mean, you go to Oxford, they'll pay for everything to go to Oxford. They'll pay for room and board, they'll pay for, I mean, they'll pay for all the way through a PhD. You can do whatever you want to do. And it's interesting asking the students why, like, I mean, maybe I have a travel bug, but like, go study in Italy for a year. I mean, it doesn't even matter if your grades are good. They're paying for it. Just go, right? Go study somewhere. It doesn't matter if you know the language. Go learn. Go enjoy. Go see the world. <clears throat> and one of the interesting things was just they, so many of the, the young people, thinking that they were going to be receiving all this money from the casino when they turned 18, had no desire. And we asked, well, why, why won't you do this thing that will be good for you? Well, I, I just can't be bothered. I'm just not that interested. It'll be good for you. Well, I'm just not that interested. Well, I may go take a semester and I'll go study at Western Carolina for a semester. That's an improvement. I will take that. Go to France. I hear the south of France is lovely. Go visit. Now. And it's intriguing because it, talking with the students and trying to convince them, like, here's a thing that's good for you. But they couldn't be motivated to do it. And the issue was not just kind of expanding their mind, but providing the, the motivation. Why would I want to go do this thing? And while it's easy to sit there and kind of condemn them and judge them, oh, how foolish they would be, it's intriguing how much a similar mindset echoes in my own heart in my relationship with the Lord. Where God is saying, look, here's my law, go do this thing, it's good for you. And we're like, I can't be bothered. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not interested. And God's like, it's good for you. I, I just can't be bothered. I, ju I just can't obey this time. It's just easier to stay in my current situation. I think that's kind of the point we're at in Matthew, uh, specifically in the Sermon on the Mount. So obviously, Matthew's introduced Jesus as the high king. He's uh, introduced this idea of salvation through Christ and his ministry. We're going to see that come to fruition later. But Jesus has now begun his first great sermon. And he's laid out for people from the very beginning in these beatitudes. Look, my kingdom is not going to be the type of kingdom you're expecting. It's not going to be one that's simply governed by swords and shields. It's not going to be one that you can determine by what color flag is being waved. It's one uh, that is marked by a spiritual transformation. We know that word today is salvation. It's, it's marked by people being brought from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive, being made new, being filled with the Spirit of God, and living differently in the life that God is giving them. As you continued through this, right, verses 17 and following in chapter 5, Jesus has laid out kind of these comparative statements. You've heard it said this about the law, but I tell you, it's bigger than that. There's something fuller taking place. You've heard it said, don't murder. And in your head, you might be thinking, well, I got this. I haven't murdered anybody. I mean, I've done some of the other Ten Commandments, but I haven't done that one. And Jesus says, well, no, let's, let's look. The heart is the issue. Murder is the sin of the hands. Anger is that same sin of the heart. Adultery is the sin of the hands. Lust is the sin of the heart. They're intimately connected. 
Revenge is the sin of the hands. Not trusting God to be your defender is the sin of the heart. And challenging His people to live according to the law of God. And it's interesting, if you're following the ministry of Jesus at this point, you're understanding that, look, He's laid out. He's the high king, and these are the rules of His kingdom. And he's the good king, and his his kingdom is a good place to live, and I should live the way that he's told me to live. But the interesting thing is, even though I'm a member of his kingdom, and you are as well, I'm assuming, you know, Jesus, you've come to understand salvation, the Spirit's worked in your heart, you'll notice that we still have a confession of sin every week. It's not like we're we're converted and instantly we stop sinning. I mean, at that point, you wouldn't need a pastor. We just need evangelists everywhere. No, instead, we we have this continuing sin that, that bubbles up out of our heart and we go, well, I know that it's good. God's told me that it's good to obey Him, but guess what? I still don't do it. And I love to think through, just kind of categorize, thinking through in my own mind like, why is it that I still sin? And I, I don't mean that from the like theological sense. I mean it from the sense of like when I am committing an intentional sin, like and I'm in a circumstance where I know what I'm about to do is evil. What's going on in my head? Like what's, what's the thought process? And it's interesting that this is a field of study that most of us have a PhD in. Lying to ourselves, right? We're, we're excellent at this. I mean, if we're honest, when we are, we, I just don't want to give up the pleasure of sin. Right? Sometimes when we commit sin, when we uh, intentionally sin against the Lord God, sometimes it's that we know we're doing it and we just we think sin feels too good for a moment. I just don't want to, I just want to stop. Other times, we might be a little bit more cynical or pessimistic and say, well, it won't make any difference if I obey. Sinning, obedience in this situation, there's no difference either way. Sometimes we might be a little bit more um, false in our theology and say, well, I've been forgiven. I don't have to obey. I'm, I'm free. I have Christian liberty. I've heard some Christians use that term perhaps maybe loosely in some cases with the worst language in the history of the world say well I have Christian liberty well friend you have Christian liberty to obey you don't have Christian liberty to sin sometimes we say well it's, it's just not worth it right holiness isn't worth it sometimes we'll say things like well it just doesn't matter this time right this one time the rest of my life I'm trying to honor God but this time well I'll just fudge it a little bit right If we're honest, I think one of the other ones is so common is it, it just seems too difficult or painful to obey. We're cowards. It just hurts too much. Obedience seems to have a cost and it, it just hurts too much. I love thinking about those things, and one is they tend to haunt you the next time you do go to sin intentionally because you hear your own voice ringing in your head and you're like, oh, I shouldn't do this. <clears throat> but secondly, what it ends up showing is it shows that our, our value system is broken. It, it's showing that when we sin in that moment, we're choosing the option that we think is the best option. And for some reason, something in our minds has been distorted to say, we believe this is a better choice than whatever God has told me. And I love how in the Bible, the Lord knows us so well, and He provides correctives for even things like this. He provides mechanisms to reshape how we think. And I'm going to suggest the sermon today, what you're about to hear, is a thing that in Reform Christendom, we have failed terribly at talking about. I'm just going to be up front. In Reformed Christianity, I think this is an area that we have failed miserably at discussing. 
What Jesus is laying out here, I think, in chapter 6, and certainly the part that we're going to look at and the way we're going to focus in on it, he's addressing that question, why do I not, why am I not more obedient than I want to be? I, I want to obey, but I still choose sin, but why, why do I not obey more than I want to obey? He's, he's providing a, a solution to that. Now, I, I do have to give one kind of standard caveat. This sermon is specifically aimed at those that already know the Lord Jesus and have already been saved. If you do not know the Lord Jesus, I love you. Last week's sermon and next week's sermon will be for you, but this week's you need to ask me about at another time. <clears throat> because what's happening here, I think, in chapter 6 is Jesus is taking a very specific kind of Old Testament idea and applying it in a very specific New Testament fashion. And here's the backdrop, I think, of what's happening in chapter 6 in light of chapter 5. 5 is just laid out for us. Look, here's what the law said. You said it, 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 you shall not murder, but anger is the issue. It's not just sins of the hand, it's sins of the heart. Well, what's happening in chapter 5, I think there's a background principle, and it is this. Law-keeping, obedience to God's law, law-keeping, always has a reward. That's the backdrop of what's happening here. Law-keeping always brings a reward with it. It always has a reward. There is always, it does not matter who you are, there is always a benefit to obeying God's law. You live by the Ten Commandments. You will be blessed. I've said this jokingly for years. It's one of the easy ways for me to remember this. But if you live by the Ten Commandments, you are not likely to end up on Jerry Springer. You're not likely to end up on Dateline or 48 Hours Mystery or any of those sorts of terrible crime dramas. You're not likely to end up on those things because your life is being matched to the Ten Commandments. If you watch enough Dateline, you realize what does it take to get murdered on that show? Drugs, money, and affair. Those are the three magic trio. As long as you're not doing those things, odds improve for you immensely. But it's interesting, there's so many blessings throughout the Old Testament that are, are laid out and connected to obedience constantly. God's presence is connected to obedience. Wealth is connected to obedience. Generic blessing is connected to obedience. In fact, that's so much of the point of the book of Proverbs. When you obey God's law, when you live in wisdom, what follows? Blessing. What follows, it, it, it spills over in the rest of your life so that everything is transformed by this kind of connection to the law of God. It's one of the reasons, I believe, why uh, there are requirements for the officers of the church that are not just doctrinal, but in their home and in their profession. Because living in God's law, living in obedience, it, the, God blesses it and it spills over into other areas of life. They're markers of wisdom. It's even called the Deuteron uh, Deuteronomic Principle, where throughout the book of Deuteronomy, it's laid out with great regularity that if you obey God's law, there are blessings connected to it. Chapter 4, verse 40. Therefore you shall keep his statutes and commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for all time. It's in the Ten Commandments. What's the first commandment with a promise? Honor your father and mother so that you may live long. There's blessing attached to the Ten Commandments. Now, again, that doesn't mean there's not difficulty. That doesn't mean it's a one-to-one. -one. That's what Job's friends do. They read blessing and then try to go backwards to obedience. It doesn't work that way. That's the background of what's taking place in the chapter is that obedience always uh, brings blessing with it. Law keeping always brings reward with it. Now, interestingly, Jesus then takes that principle and begins to apply it in chapter 6. Here, first kind of thing we're going to look at, verses 1 through 4, he gives us a, a framework to approach this with. Not every reward is equally excellent. 
This should be obvious, but not every reward is equally excellent. A, a gold medal is not the same as a silver medal. It's not the same as a bronze medal. There's different types of rewards. Some are more desirable than others. Look at verses 1 through 4. Beware of practicing your righteousness. We're going to come back to that. Before other people in order to be seen, for them, seen by them. For then you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Why? Well, here's the example. Thus, when you give to the needy, you're assuming you are giving to the needy. That's a command given in Scripture. This is a way to obey God's law. When you give to the needy, when your obedience is done, you can either do it publicly. You can bring with you a trumpet to announce it. I'm about to give to the needy. Call everybody's attention to it. You can do it the way the hypocrites do in the synagogues, in the holy place where all of the good and respectable people will notice you, and then do it uh, in the streets, again, where the good and respectable people will notice you, and you can obey God by giving to the poor where everybody sees you, and guess what? You get a reward, but your reward is a human reward. It's an earthly reward. You get it right there in the moment. You get the praise of your peers, the praise of your neighbor, the praise of mankind. We are watching this happen in our current cultural moment in the most, like, just nonsensical ways I've ever seen. The ways that companies are currently virtue signaling is the technical term now, where they're, they're trying to make their obedience public so that you buy their brand. I mean, even yesterday's watching a thing on YouTube and got a, a commercial for socks. Oh, I don't know. But YouTube's, uh, the ad was amazing because it said, these socks are the most comfortable socks you'll ever own. Okay, I'm, I might believe you. Why are they the most comfortable socks you've ever owned? Because you'll know that when you bought these socks, we gave another pair of socks to somebody in need, and that makes them the most comfortable socks you've ever worn. Really? I would have thought like cushy, you know, <laughs> softness, the elastic fitting. I would have thought those things would have made for comfortable socks. I didn't know your generosity would make my socks more comfortable. <laughs> what are they doing? They're, they're trying to make their good deeds obvious so that they get the human blessing right away. They want my business. They want my money. Buy our socks. Interestingly, Jesus is acknowledging, look, when you, when you do works of kindness and good deeds in this way, there's a way to do them so that people notice you and so that people give you the honor and the respect and the glory and the goodness that you think you deserve. The problem is it is an entirely earthly transaction. It does not have a spiritual, it does not have a heavenly component in that regard. It is an entirely earthly transaction. My sock company is getting a blessing for giving socks to the poor. But what is that blessing? It's my money. That's all they're getting. Jesus instead here says, look, instead of doing it this way, instead of being obvious in your obedience, verse 3, instead when you give to the needy, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Right? Hide it almost. Make it difficult to see your obedience. Do it in anonymity and obscurity. Why? So that your giving would be in secret, verse 4, and so that your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is how gracious our God is. That interestingly, those private moments of obedience... And we're going to be honest, right? Private moments of obedience are the ones that are the most difficult. The ones where we can look around and say, nobody's going to see me here. Right? If I do the wrong thing, I'll never get caught. The only one who knows that I'd be doing the wrong thing are God and maybe some angels in the room. No one knows. Interestingly, what does God say? When you do the right thing, even in the secret place, in the most quiet and unnoticed fashion, God blesses. He blesses. And, and I love how what he's doing here is he's, he's correcting my motivation. 
So that when I'm in that secret place and I'm in that secret moment and no one else knows and I'm, I'm not having the, the, the strength of peer pressure to help me and I'm not surrounded by the body of Christ looking at me being like, don't be an idiot, what are you doing? When I'm by myself and I'm fighting against temptation, Jesus is providing a correction to say, look, even though no one else knows what you're doing, your father does and he blesses you for obedience. He pours out the, the, the blessings of heaven upon you for things that you might not even ever be observed in doing. You see, this human reward, it's an earthly reward. It's often an immediate reward. Uh, it is inside the created order, and it's largely connected to recognition. Again, you think so much of the, the kind of cultural charity industry in our great country is about trying to make my ego be appeased, try to make me look good, to give me recognition for my good deeds, recognition for my good works. It's interesting, the, the biblical pattern instead is when God's people obey him in private and obey him in secret as well as in public. He blesses them with his presence. He blesses them with the riches of heaven. And friends, I'm just going to highlight here for just a moment. This is one of the fun parts we think about God's character. Our God is infinitely creative. Right? So when he goes to bless you, he's infinitely creative. He, he doesn't like run out of options. And it's not like a, a husband who's waited until Christmas Eve to go, shopping for his wife, and he's like, I got three things, they weren't at the store, and I don't know what to do now. What am I going to give? I don't know. I have no idea. What should I find? I'll just grab something. And our God is infinitely creative. When he goes to bless his people, he, he's creative in pouring out his riches upon his people. Now, I would make the point just very quickly that this is where the prosperity gospel goes wrong because so many preachers today that are preaching God's prosperity and God's blessing they forget that he's creative. And they say, well, when you obey, God gives you financial wealth. Please. Our God is way more creative than that. And he also gives things that are actually important. I mean, wealth is important to us. It's far less important to him. He gives us himself. He gives us peace. He gives us the spirit. He gives us power. He gives us victory over temptation. He gives us answer to prayer. He gives us all sorts of things. Financial wealth is perhaps one of the least important, actually, of the many blessings he gives. It's really interesting to think about, and I would encourage you, honestly, I would strongly encourage you to be able to start thinking this way. That when you're particularly in private and you're fighting against sin and fighting against temptation and trying to do the right thing, it is right and good and biblical to say, my God will reward me for doing the right thing. I'm not going to sin. I'm not, not this time. Hopefully not next time. I'm not going to sin. Again, and I said, I think Reformed Christendom tends to struggle with this because we're, we're afraid of the reality. But this is true throughout all the scriptures. It's amazing how common of a theme this is. I mean, Paul even does it. Why should you obey your elders in the church? Because it's good for you. That's literally the next words he writes. Because it's good for you. So much of, uh, interestingly, obedience to God is, is put within this context of it's good for you. You're blessed when you do it. Now, you could kind of see how uh, this could easily be distorted into a kind of a false transactional relationship with our God. If God has said, look, if you, when you obey, I will reward you. I firmly believe he rewards both in this life and the life to come. It's an already, not yet. 
The Lord, I believe, is firmly generous and rewarding His children. I could tell you a number of stories and other situations about tithing, and I, I firmly believe He rewards generously. But it would be easy for us to slip into a transactional relationship with God to say, well, I'm not really interested in God, I'm just interested in His blessings. And, and then to begin to think of Him as some sort of kind of divine genie. Right? What do I have to do in order to get God to give me whatever I want? What do I have to do? Do I, I get a certain number of wishes? Do I get a certain number of wishes per day? Do I, what's the way that I get God's blessing upon me? And I think that's actually interestingly the thing that he jumps at next is what's the method, the mechanism for this? He jumps to the issue of prayer. This is so intriguing to me. I think in this week's preparation for this, this is the part that has melted my brain the most. Luke, where he records the Lord's Prayer, it's recorded specifically on a section about prayer. Matthew separates the two parts of this section and puts the Lord's Prayer specifically in the context of reward. You want to know how to get God's reward, how to get God's blessing, how to do this? Well, uh, when you pray, assuming you pray, you should pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They go stand in the synagogues to find the holy people to be impressed with how they pray. They go stand on the street corners. Oh, be impressed with my good works. Everybody watch me. Everybody listen to me. Watch how I pray all about me. Well, Jesus says they got their reward. Their friends watched them. That was it. They got all the reward they're going to get. Instead, you, as with the other, go do it in secret, and God watches in secret. And what this could easily turn into here, you could easily see, would be some sort of kind of superstitious relationship. Oh, if I do these seven types of prayers, if I do these 14 different types of repetitions, if I do these certain kind of mechanistic steps of, of interacting with God, then He'll bless me, right? Right? I mean, we've certainly never watched that happen in the church today. I'll give you a hint. That's what the rosary is. That's what the rosary is. It's a, a necklace made of beads that you can count through to help to manufacture God's blessings as you simply recite what he's doing. Interestingly, what does Jesus say? Verse 7, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they're going to be heard for their repetitions. Listening to this, it reminds me of that, that great story in the Old Testament where you have the prophets of Baal versus the prophet of God, right? And they've got the two altars and they've poured, uh, you know, uh, they've got uh, one altar that's being ready to be consumed with fire. You've got the other that's had the water poured on it so that it'd be even harder to get lit up. And what happens? The prophets of Baal begin to cry out to their false god and he doesn't answer them. And what does the prophet of God say? He begins to taunt them, right? Maybe your god's asleep! Maybe you should pray louder. He can't hear you. And eventually, what do they do? They begin to even you know, beat themselves and hurt their bodies in hoping that their blood would awaken their God. And then you see the prophet of God. What does he do? He stands off to the side and he prays. Oh, Lord, it's time to show your power. Would you please? Here, instead of these vain repetitions of calling out, trying to trick a God into listening, trying to trick our God into hearing us, what instead does he say? Don't be like that. We're not called to be superstitious. Instead, what is our prayer to sound like? And he gives what we know as the Lord's Prayer, which is intriguing. It's a content-driven prayer. It is a petition request-driven prayer that moves quickly and rapidly. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's request number one. Your name be holy. Your kingdom come. Uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Request two, give us this day our daily bread. Request three, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Request four, lead us not to temptation. It's a request different prayer, but the content moves quickly. You see, this is the real kind of contrast that's laid out here is that God's people, it's marked by a, a deep and rich content-driven relationship with their God. It's not marked by vain and needless repetition. 
It's the difference between a child that comes up to their parent and says, parent, I need X, Y, and Z for school. Can you please get them for me? And somebody that just begs incessantly like a dog beside the table looking for food. You don't need the food. I feed you every day, twice. All you're doing now is just begging and hoping that I'm going to cave and be soft because I never have been and I'm never going to be. This contrast between this kind of mystical superstition that the world has to offer and a, a humble presence of God marked by the people of God here. Now, again, if your heart's anything like mine, you would immediately kind of see, well, okay, here's the kind of relationship that Jesus is laying out, that when I obey him, particularly in secret, God blesses me. And the primary way that he blesses me is through his presence and even through me asking. As I'm obedient, he pours out the blessings of heaven upon me. And if your heart's anything like mine, the next thing I might say is, well, maybe I can fake it. Right, we all know that sort of obedience that's not really obedience. It might seemingly kind of look good on the outside, perhaps even, but the heart's all yucky on the inside. We watch this if you had little kids around or grandkids or worked in a nursery or anything of the sort, and you say, well, tell them, they're so tell them you're sorry. What does the kid say? I'm sorry. Are you really? Doesn't sound very sorry. Sounds angry, actually, funny enough. I think Jesus gets to the next thing here with fasting in verses 16 through 18, where he says, when you fast, again, assuming you fast, it's a holy thing to do in the weakness of your body. It showcases your spiritual need, gives you an opportunity to pray. When you fast, when you do this holy obedience, don't be like the hypocrites who get all grumpy and unpleasant to be around. And they're nasty and they're just unpleasant. They, they're disfiguring their faces because they're so miserable. It's pretend obedience. It's that obedience where they seem to do the right thing, but they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Again, to try to get attention drawn on themselves. Instead of a rich obedience that is from the heart. I would lovingly just kind of challenge you to think about this as well, where, where, are, you, where are you practicing pretend obedience? That obedience that you know is the right action to do, but you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Where are you cheating, so to speak? Well, lastly and very quickly, uh, Jesus gives us a couple of kind of applications, commands in regards to this. First and foremost, uh, this is the one that's so intriguing, how, how generous our God is. Uh, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Uh, don't worry about treasures here. They're going to burn. They're designed to pass away. Instead, interestingly, a command, verse 20, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus is commanding you to grow wealthy in the heavenly kingdom. Now, I don't simply mean physical wealth. I mean spiritual wealth. It is, hear me say this, it is good and right and obedient to keep God's law with an obedient heart for what will come in the future. It is absolutely okay to say, I don't want to do the right thing here, but I'm going to do the right thing because I want the treasure in heaven that Jesus gives. That is okay. It's actually more than okay. It's good and it's right. I would also just lovingly encourage you to remember, Jesus has the best interest rate of all time. Right? Our banks right now are paying kind of peanuts for your interest rate. Oh, good, I have a savings account. Here's a quarter, right? Nothing useful. Jesus, his interest rate is, is insane. You put in this amount in the life to come, it yields this amount. It's important for when we think about obedience to the Lord. I'm only able to give this much obedience. I'm really bad at it. Jesus rewards so much bigger. 
Secondly, <clears throat> beware of pursuing the wrong rewards. That's verse 1. Beware of doing the right thing, but doing the right thing in order to be seen. Doing the right thing so that other people will notice you. Doing the right thing so that you will get the attention of mankind. Doing the right thing to virtue signal. I, I mean, there's more than a week's worth of talking about that in our current culture today. Virtue signaling left, right, and center constantly. May it never be in the church. And then lastly, at verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I would encourage you to spend a little time today just considering what you value, what's important to you, where your treasure are you looking for? What's the thing that you said, if I only had this, my life would be, would, I'd make it. But if I only had this, life would be perfect. Because most often that this, whatever it is, is going to showcase to you what you value the most. And again, highlighting all of this is by the Lord's generosity that he gives freely to his children. Let's pray. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. We praise you. We ask that you would increase in our mind the conviction that you are generous and gracious with your people. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's stand and sing all for Jesus. benediction of God in Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.